Welcome, everyone. Um, How can you? Including me. Just pull my bags off the chair so more people can sit down. Um, welcome. This is our uh, normal Thursday talks. But today we have a very special guest, and I'm very happy to um, introduce Dr. Bala Subramaniam Murali, who is the UNDP um, representative for Afghanistan and Iran. Um, his, he has a PhD in economics from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, as well as masters and bachelors from the University of Madras in India. Um, since our campus is focusing on academics, I thought I would just present his academic credentials as well as his UN credentials. As a program advisor, he is in charge of one of the largest programs for our, for from the UNDP, uh, which is financing, I think, something like $750 million uh, US dollars for development in Afghanistan and in Iran. He is also currently elected staff representative for the UNDP, UNFPA, which I'm not sure what you mean. The Fund for Population Activities. Population Activities and UNOPS. Office of Project Services. Of, okay, uh, Global Staff Council. Um, he was previously the desk officer for Malaysia, the Philippines, and Timor-Leste from 2006. He's also had numerous other positions, which I won't go down the entire list, but um, prior to that, he started his work with the UNDP since 1997. So he has a long experience with UNDP and has been around the world in many different positions. And we're really happy to have him come here today to talk about Afghanistan and current situations in Afghanistan, developments and UNDP's role. So please join me. Uh, before I go on, uh, he also is giving a talk later. Um, this is going to be um, uh, a talk this afternoon. It's your future with the UN, a career talk. So if you want to get a job in the UN, uh, you need to talk to him. <laughs> no. I had a lot of people. I wish I had jobs to give away I like that. Give you a job, I said, I doubt it, but you should go down and listen anyway. And I also want to say that this uh, talk series is hosted not just by our Center for South Asia, but the Center for Russia, East Europe, and Central Asia, our Center for South Asia, the Global Health Initiative, Global Studies. Go Global, International Learning Community, International Student Services, um, Millennial Development Goals Awareness Project, Model United Nations, and the WUD Global Connection. So a lot of people have come together to bring this um, a very esteemed scholar here to present to us this information. So please welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that most comprehensive uh, introduction. Uh, I hope I'm audible at the back. Yes. Uh, okay, good. Um, uh, good morning or good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know about me uh, and what I do. Uh, it's been uh, almost uh, two years to this month uh, that I was given the responsibility for the portfolio for Afghanistan and Iran. I took it over in February '09, and it has been a very interesting journey. Um, as, as it was remarked, Afghanistan happens to be UNDP's single largest program in the world. Uh, in 2010, in the year 2010, we delivered assistance worth nearly $800 million uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, this is the largest program by several miles as compared to any other country. Uh, which is a very interesting uh, point to begin uh, because it clearly shows, this is not, let me also clarify, this is not UN or UNDP money I'm talking about. Almost 90% of it comes from donor governments. Um, US is the second largest donor to UNDP in Afghanistan. Japan is the first. Uh, we are dealing with something like 25 countries which are putting money into this uh, pool. Uh, last year, we mobilized uh, about $1.2 billion for last year and the succeeding years. So it's a pointer to the fact that uh, clearly global attention is focused on Afghanistan for various reasons. Um, and Afghanistan happens to be one of the few country portfolios where UNDP or any part of the UN system doesn't have to go and actively mobilize resources. Otherwise, we normally <coughs> go to donor capitals, make presentations, and mobilize support. Uh, Afghanistan, we are in a very envious position where uh, the only thing I have been all along saying is no more, no more, please don't put in any more money because, you know, it's really reaching uh, the limits, it's stretching us to the limits of our capacity. Now, having said that, 
I I'm not sure how familiar all of you uh, with regard to the geographic location of the Afghanistan of Afghanistan. So I took the chance to put in this map uh, for two reasons. One to make you familiar where what's the context we are talking of. The other important reason is uh, please do look at the borders of Afghanistan, uh, which in a big way has an impact on what's happening in Afghanistan. You have Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan on the top, the Central Asian Republics. It has, Afghanistan has a border with China. Uh, this actually, this is a little bit of a, a missed thing. India does not, because this part of India up north is actually Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Uh, so India does not have any border, uh, but this is the official map. Uh, and Pakistan of course has a huge border and another huge border with Iran. The reason why I'm highlighting it is that I think the context of our today's discussion is going to be impacted a lot by these countries that surround Afghanistan. So it's very important for you to know. Uh, Kabul uh, is, uh, if you, there is no direct flight from US, but if it is a direct flight, it'll take us about uh, 15 hours. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's the distance we are talking of. That's something that I do four or five times a year. Uh, going back and forth uh, to Afghanistan. I also wanted to share this map, which is very interesting, for a completely different reason. Oh, sorry, uh, to go back, the other thing I forgot to point out is that there are 34 provinces uh, within Afghanistan. Um, all, of course, all of them are named, and, and the capital, Kabul, is here, and the rest all are provinces. Um, we can come back to the map as we move along. This map is very interesting uh, because in Afghanistan for the first time, it was not done in Iraq, it was not done in other places, for the first time the global community introduced a, uh, a, a mechanism, I can say if I say that way, called PRTs, which is basically Provincial Reconstruction Teams. Uh, the idea being that uh, each of these flags you see will represent the country which has the lead in the local provincial reconstruction team. You can straight away see US, oh, I thought there was a pointer. I don't have to. There is, uh, there is US, there is Canada, UK, uh, there is Italy, uh, that I think is Spain. Spain, Norway, Sweden, Germany in two places. Uh, then we have uh, US in lots of locations. Turkey is a very big player. So. This is just to give an idea of how the international community is doing its work in Afghanistan. Now, the, the, the logic behind the PRTs is that most of these places, oops, what did I do? Sorry, I pressed the wrong one. Most of these areas uh, outside of Kabul, especially this belt, the south, uh, in fact, right now there is, uh, there is actual, you can say in a way, a war going on in Kandahar and Helmand, where the NATO troops are fighting the terrorists. These areas plus this area and even this is mostly out of bounds uh, if you want to go in like in the good old days and do development work. Uh, so the reason why they came up with this idea is that they set up in each of these locations, the country will set up a small campus, if you want to call it, with military present which can provide the security. And then they have now started putting in people from those countries working on development. Um, it's a bit of a very strange uh, mix of how you do development, but this is completely necessitated due to the situation in Afghanistan. So that's the reason why I want to share. You can see this basically means these countries in the bare minimum has both military as well as civilian personnel uh, in Afghanistan. So you can see the spread. Uh, Turkey and I think uh, there's one more. Uh, there are two countries. Um, I think it's, I do not know which one is this. I think it's in Goar province. The two of them are in fact civilian PRTs, meaning there's no military. There are just civilians living inside a secure compound and working. But the rest all are military PRTs. This is also significant because uh, as announced by President Obama, the NATO forces will begin withdrawing sometime in June, July of this year and the withdrawal is expected to complete by 2014. So this is very important because these are solid infrastructure to do development in Afghanistan. 
So right now, one of the biggest debates that's going on is what's going to be the future of these PRTs, what form or shape it, it will take. We were approached, UN was approached, and we have basically said that if it continues to be a military PRT, we cannot take it over. So in a way, we are forcing the hands of the military to transfer the leadership uh, to the civilians. But let's see. That's a, that's a very complicated debate. Let's uh, run through this quickly. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. I'm trying to go as quickly as possible. I know I can't finish all my slides, uh, keeping in mind uh, the time, and then we can have enough time for discussion. Now, here are some of the, I have not given the, an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to begin with this, to give you a flavor of where Afghanistan is today in uh, the global development uh, context. Uh, as you see, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you might be familiar, UNDP brings out an annual publication called the Human Development Report, which comes every year uh, since 1990. Um, and uh, one of the things it does is that it ranks countries on the basis of uh, um, multiple multiplicity of indices, uh, like um, life expectancy, maternal mortality, education, uh, various other things. And in that list, there are a total of 169 countries now, and Afghanistan is 155th, which means it's at almost at the bottom. Uh, it is the uh, it is it has got the lowest uh, human development indicator in Asia, and uh, all the 13 or 14 countries that are worse off than Afghanistan, unfortunately, are all in Africa. Uh, so it, it's a very serious uh, issue as far as the, the overall. And look at, look at uh, these figures. I thought, I normally don't do this, but then I just thought, let's compare it to US to get you a perspective of where we are. Life expectancy in Afghanistan today is 44.6. That's the seventh lowest among the 194 member states of the UN, as compared to US, which is 78.3. So you can imagine, that's one of the stark indicators in terms of uh, actual service delivery to people at the ground level. Uh, the second one, of course, is uh, the, we'll come to it later as one of the challenges, which is capacity in the country, uh, is, the, is the mean versus expected years of schooling. Um, the expected years itself in Afghanistan is very low. It's only eight, out of which the mean, which most people achieve, is only 3.3. .3. Now, and uh, we will come down to it in terms of uh, females, it's even worse. And look at, uh, look at the GNI per capita PPP uh, is just 1419. Uh, and that too largely because, uh, but let me also say, many of these indicators can be challenged in the sense that one of the biggest struggles we have in Afghanistan is that there is no reliable uh, data sets available. Uh, so this is basically gleaned from several sources. Uh, I also want to, um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking on the MDG context in Afghanistan, uh, because this is something that most of us are familiar with, I'm hoping, the Millennium Development Goals, and the fact that all the countries uh, have committed to achieve these targets by 2015. Um, you can see poverty and hunger, it's one of the most uh, impoverished countries in the world, 20 to 40 percent of Afghans need varying levels of food assistance at different times of the year. It fluctuates wildly. Uh, the World Food Program, which is another UN agency, has large uh, food reserves in Afghanistan, which are basically intended for distributing uh, uh, to people when they run out of uh, food. In fact, it came in very handy during the recent floods in Pakistan, uh, because most of the stocks in Pakistan were washed away by the floods, and in fact, we managed to airlift a lot of stuff from Afghanistan into Pakistan. So this is a, this is a major, major challenge. Uh, education, um, no data is available for net enrollment. School attendance rate was 54% uh, in 2003. Uh, that's, that's about the last data we have. Um, and overall primary completion rate is estimated at 45%. And here begins the thing look at look at the look at the percentage for women uh, this is one of the biggest challenges now um, this is again uh, I intentionally included it because I think it presents to you a very 
powerful picture of uh, women in Afghanistan. Um, you know, they are about, uh, I think, well over 40% of the population. Uh, and this is where they are. Uh, the only good thing that has happened so far is the fact that uh, w the UN helped them. In fact, I must, I must tell, I should have told you this right at the beginning. One of our, one of our big challenges in Afghanistan, let me take a minute on this. One of our big challenges in Afghanistan is that when in 2002, when the Taliban was uh, driven out by the, by the uh, ally, uh, U U UN forces led by United States, what was inherited by the international community as a country in Afghanistan uh, was something that was, it's beyond um, explanation. It was completely destroyed. Uh, most of the infrastructure was gone, uh, especially school buildings, hospitals, medical clinics, roads, bridges, airstrips. Everything was in a state of either uh, disuse, disrepair, or willfully destroyed. So in a way, 2002 big marks the beginning of a reconstruction in Afghanistan. <coughs> so in some ways, what I try to explain to people is that, please be patient, it's just nine years. And nine years is not a long time when you're talking of rebuilding a country from scratch. And one of the worst affected sections of population are women in Afghanistan. Uh, but one of the good things we managed to do, the UN helped Afghanistan write a new constitution, uh, adopt a parliamentary system of government. We have an elected parliament right now, uh, which is the second one. The first one was elected in 2005. We just completed the elections last September. And we have a new parliament which was inaugurated barely a month ago. In that parliament, we had managed to put in almost a 26% reservation of seats for women. Meaning these are seats in which only women can contest and only women will be elected. And in 2010, in fact, in 2005, uh, there was a big struggle. We couldn't get past 13, 14 percent uh, of women. Uh, many constituencies went without any candidates because no woman was willing to come forward and even contest. In the 2010 elections, it was an altogether different story. Today, we have in fact exceeded, I think there are two more than the minimum required in terms of women in parliament, which I think is a very important transformation. Uh, so we have 27% of women uh, elected in, uh, uh, in the parliament. Uh, but then the story is, of course, at the subnational and local governance bodies, uh, you, you would more or less fall off your chair if you find a woman in any, any decision-making positions. They, they hardly come out. And, and also, I think, as I was mentioning to colleagues at dinner last night, it is not as though we are talking of a country which has a tradition of, uh, what do you say, keeping women um, at, as at the second tier. In fact, in late 70s uh, in Afghanistan, uh, women were highly educated, uh, were uh, very competent, were leaders in their own field. So the last 30 years of struggle has completely destroyed this particular aspect. Uh, lowest percentage of female literacy among neighboring countries, uh, it's, uh, you can see, it's 5.8 as compared to 34 for males. Especially when you look at secondary education and 25 years of age. Those are the two criteria. If you go by that criterion, the female literacy rate in Afghanistan is just under 6%, which is one of the lowest in the world. And this has been one of our huge uh, challenges. Yep. Is that 6% graduates of secondary education or 6% literacy among graduates of secondary education among the 25? It is, it is uh, those who have, com among those, it's a comparable size of those who have completed secondary education and uh, have uh, attained 25 years of age, uh, which is primarily the, the core population which one would target in terms of development work. That's the... Uh, um, of course, the, the other indicators are no good either. Uh, look at child mortality. Infant and under five mortality rates are among the highest in the world. You have 165 um, uh, deaths per thousand live births. And, uh, and 257 die before the age of five. 
and look at the, uh, there's just no comparison. These are the figures for the United States, seven and eight. Seven infant mortality deaths uh, uh, and eight under five mortality deaths per thousand live births. It's a comparable statistics. Under five mortality rate and the infant mortality rate is targeted to reduce by 50% of the 2003 levels by 2015. Uh, clearly, of course, as you might have well imagined, Afghanistan is in no position to achieve any of the MDG targets by 2015. And even this uh, is becoming <coughs> more and more uh, difficult now, and I'll come to it, uh, I'll come to it in a minute. Um, I also wanted to put in maternal health, because that's another key indicator, um, which, is, uh, which is one of the drivers of this overall low HDI for Afghanistan. Uh, maternal mortality rate, 1,600 deaths per 100,000 live births. 1,600 mothers don't make it um, out of every 100,000 live births in Afghanistan. The, uh, the facilities, especially in the rural areas, are almost non-existent. Um, and uh, I'd, uh, and uh, we have never, I think we have some figures. I think the number of what they call as assisted deliveries, meaning where you get some medical help, is something like 2 or 3 percent. Uh, because most of the places, there is not even any basic medical facility available as compared to 8 per 100,000. Yeah, and the highest MMR uh, rate, um, especially in some of these uh, remote provinces, which have no facilities at all. Yeah. Uh, I know that many of these areas aren't really accessible to hospitals. Are there any midwives in Afghanistan? Uh, there are. But, uh, but there again, the distances, what we often find, is uh, too daunting. And the security situation, too bad for them to be able to go around providing this service. So that's, uh, that's another. Uh, there is a very high risk for the spread of HIV AIDS, uh, simply because there is rampant drug use. Uh, it's one of the most easiest ones that's available. Uh, in fact, Afghanistan, sadly, is in a way the opium capital of the world. It produces. And in fact, this opium, we'll come back to it subsequently in the presentation, how it funds the entire uh, terrorism. Narco-terrorism is one of the biggest challenges in Afghanistan. Uh, malaria is prevalent in 60% of the country, with uh, over 13 million people at risk. So that's, that's again, another very stark. Uh, OK. Now we come to the, uh, to the core part. Um, what I, basic, what I have basically done is to give you, I can't obviously run through in this limited time all the challenges we face. So I picked uh, these five because these are the five in our opinion, in UNDP's opinion, in my opinion, uh, in my, based on my work over the last two years in the country, these are the five that are the biggest and most critical challenges. And these also are challenges, if overcome, can uh, have, um, what do you call, uh, a geomet geometric effect on how the overall situation in the country will improve. Uh, security situation, which is, which is the biggest challenge. Um, as many of you may know or may have read or may not have read, uh, the situation is actually, unfortunately, is worsening. It's not improving. Um, um, if I can, I would actually like to go back to the slide, the first slide of the map, yeah. This entire part, starting with Paktika, Zabul, Kandahar, Helmand and Nimroz, not so much Nimroz even, these four, are the core of the NATO forces operation today. For example, uh, all these four and uh, Nimroz are out of bounds, uh, even for UN, we can't go. Uh, unless we are escorted by by either British. Uh, Helmand is uh, largely a British uh, area, and Kandahar is where most of the US forces are concentrated. What is really happening? Why the situation is deteriorating? Now, these parts of Afghanistan, the north and the west, were generally, till about a couple of years ago, considered very safe. Uh, we, have, we have people almost in all these places, in Herat, in Faryab, in Mazar-e-Sharif. Uh, Mazar-e-Sharif is, of course, very famous, as many of you might know. It had those two world's tallest uh, statues of Buddha. 
which unfortunately uh, was blown up uh, by the by the by it was the in Bamiya. Bamiya. Well, I'm sorry, in Bamiya. It was in Bamiya. Yeah, in Bamiya. Um, <coughs> uh, Mazar-e Sharif, of course, is a very historic town. Uh, now, these places in and Bamiya. Uh, Bamiya, by the way, is the only province that has a lady governor, and uh, you must meet her. She is something <laughs> very bold. Uh, and uh, she has practically eliminated uh, opium cultivation in her province. Uh, she, has some of the, she has set up some of the strongest community policing networks within her province. So these provinces were generally considered safe till a couple of years ago, and we had people, UN staff, working in all these provinces, including internationals. Now, what is happening is that the pressure that's being applied here, which is enormous, is basically making the anti-government elements to run away into Pakistan. And now the trend we are finding is they swing up north because the entire area bordering Afghanistan in Pakistan is largely uh, ungoverned <coughs> or ungovernable because they are basically called, they are the FATA and the, the federally administered territories, which is very good. So we are now beginning to find that these people pushed out of Afghanistan are going up and coming back in from the north. And we have, in fact, had some of the most devastating attacks uh, recently in all these places. Herat, our UN compound, was attacked. Just a minute. Herat, our UN compound, was uh, attacked uh, on the day before the UN day, on 23rd. Uh, I was going there. I was going to Kabul on that day. Uh, we have also had major uh, kidnappings and, uh, and attacks in all these places, in Badakhshan, in Nuristan. So, in one way, the security operation down south is succeeding. But unfortunately, because one doesn't have control over what's happening, it's, it's making the situation worse. And in fact, um, every Tuesday and Thursday, I have a video conference with our team in Afghanistan. And I was just looking at it last night, the notes I had made from uh, two days ago. Um, uh, it was reported that in the last two weeks, from Tuesday, last Tuesday, they have been averaging 60 security incidents a day across the country. And uh, the, which is double of what was happening in 2010 at the same time. So just to give you an idea of where, uh, where we stand, in the last, in February alone, so far, we have had six uh, what we call as complex attacks. These uh, complex attacks basically means that they use both a vehicle-borne uh, bomb as well as a human suicide bomber. Uh, that's what is called as a complex attack. They basically use the vehicle-borne IED to ram through the gates and blow it up. And then what will follow will be three or four or six heavily armed uh, uh, anti-government elements which wear uh, uh, suicide vests. And they fight till their ammunition runs out and basically blow themselves up. Uh, so capturing them is almost next to impossible. So there have been uh, six such attacks just in February alone. So to some extent, the security situation is really deteriorating. And we could already see that in 2010. Uh, the parliamentary elections were held in September, almost exactly a year after the presidential election in 2009. And in the presidential election in 2009, only nine out of the 34 provinces were declared as disturbed. And in one year, by the time we came to the 2010 parliamentary election, this number had go grown from nine to 16, which is to say that almost one half of Afghanistan is uh, treated as disturbed by the international community, uh, which basically means that there are multiplicity of incidents attacks on uh, targeting foreigners is, uh, or aid workers is becoming uh, more and more. Uh, so this, in fact, is one single factor. And that's why I put it right at the beginning. This is one single factor which uh, has a huge impact on what we are doing in terms of work. Basically, because it cuts off our access. We, as it is, uh, as I was uh, telling the colleagues last night at dinner, as it is, Going to Afghanistan, I do it four or five times a year, as I said, and it's an expedition. Um, and uh, once you are there, um, you know, just to give you a flavor, uh, we are all basically told um, to sleep preferably dressed 
and keep a bag by your bedside which contains your most important things, your passport, your medication, everything. Because you never know uh, what's going to happen in the middle of the night. You might, the forces might come in and just want you to get up and run. Uh, you can't say, you oh, know, I need to pick up this or I need to pack that. There won't be any time for that. Just to give you a flavor of how our visits are normally. Uh, the other major factor which, uh, which is the security situation is dictating is our cost of delivering assistance is going up enormously. Just to give you a small example, an, an armored Land Cruiser, Toyota Land Cruiser which we use, an armored one, uh, is about three and a half times as expensive as a conventional Land Cruiser which you and me can buy off the shelf in a market. And there is no other mode of transport by which you can go even to the building next door. You have to ride in an armored vehicle because you never know when there's going to be a roadside IED or an attack. So <coughs> it is factors like these which make the security situation have a huge impact on what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, there, are way, there are measures that are beginning to be addressed. One of the big things, as you will see when I go down, is also this whole concept of um, uh, reintegrating some of these anti-government elements. There are a large number of them who are simply tired. You know, how long you can fight? It's been going on for 30 years. Um, so there are, be, we are beginning to find that there are a large number of people who are willing to give up arms and get a chance to reintegrate themselves into society. The second factor, of course, is uh, that the credibility of the government institutions is pretty low. Uh, partly because of the fact how elections went on and all the, all the unwanted things that surrounded these elections. So that's another major uh, factor. Uh, and this makes it very difficult because UN particularly, unlike bilaterals like US or Canada or anybody, we normally in a country, we are quite dependent on the local government to deliver services. So if the government's credibility is so low, uh, it poses very unique problems. Uh, like for example, we just cannot transfer any resources to any provincial governor's office. Because most provincial governor's offices uh, are known to suffer from massive leakages. So these are all some of the challenges that uh, the low credibility produces. Uh, of course, as I said right at the beginning, there is a very severe lack of capacity nationally. Uh, by the time uh, the Taliban left the country, uh, practically there were no in, uh, institutions of higher learning that were left. Uh, most of the university in Kabul itself was destroyed. Um, and uh, they particularly targeted schools which had uh, female children. And most of them were blown up. So you have a situation where uh, whatever is the good, you can say, the top of the people, uh, Af local Afghans, have already left the country. Uh, we have a colleague here <coughs> who would know this much better than I do. Um, Germany, Norway, England, even US has a large number of Afghan population. So what is left in the country is, um, you know, it will take a lot of effort to bring them up to capacity. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, for example, UNDP, my entity alone, has over a thousand national staff, national Afghans, and we have hundred internationals uh, positioned there. Uh, we do find that a lot of them are very talented, uh, genuinely committed, but it will take some time to bring them up to capacity. Uh, of course, as I said, narco-terrorism, narco uh, narcotics funding, anti-government, anti-national activities is a huge, huge challenge. The concept of a private army headed by warlords is something that's very common in Afghanistan even today. Uh, there are private armies reportedly, uh, I can't be quoted on this, but this is public information in any case. There are private armies that are as large as several thousands. So obviously, the money to pay their salaries, and they are mighty well equipped. Um, you know, they have their own armored uh, vehicles in which they move around. So some, from somewhere, the money is coming for all this. Uh, these are all things that you cannot just pick off the street. Uh, and this is what we feel is uh, funding this whole um, sort of chain of violence. And of course, 
the country in itself, uh, talking in economics terms, the country is what we call in a very severe poverty trap. Uh, today, uh, it's amazing. I think this is 2009 statistics, if I'm not wrong. Over 60% of the development <coughs> budget, uh, sorry, of the operational budget, meaning this is the money the government needs to pay salaries, uh, to run services, 60% of those resources for Afghanistan comes from international contribution. And their development budget is 100% funded by, uh, by international contribution. The amount of money that's pouring into Afghanistan, uh, one can say, is almost uh, un unbelievable, if you really look at US alone, I think, uh, contributes uh, well over a billion, <coughs> billion and a half, or even two billion dollars a year. So what, is, what this is driving is that while it is able to keep the economy moving, able to provide employment, able to provide income, it is not really contributing in terms of uh, in-country resource raising. Because ultimately, the con any country will have to raise sufficient money for it to meet all the costs. So, but let me not spend much time on this because there are more interesting things to go down. So these are, in my opinion, the most critical challenges. Uh, I won't spend much time. These are our nine uh, programs. Uh, we also have a, another situation in Afghanistan where we have a camp. The entire UN system cannot have more than 750 internationals in Afghanistan at any one time. Uh, this is basically because capacity to evacuate in case of emergencies and everything else. And UNDP gets only 100 of those 750 slots. So we have taken a conscious decision to limit ourselves to focusing on these nine programs. This does not mean that there are no other challenges. One of our biggest uh, disappointments is that much as we want to do something on gender, on environment, we just don't have the capacity to do it. So these are the eight uh, programs. I wanted to just very, it's impossible to run through all the eight or nine. If people are interested, I'm quite happy to talk to them after the presentation. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of what UNDP is doing. Uh, so to say, this is my pitch. Um, uh, this is, of course, our biggest program, Law and Order Trust Fund for Afghanistan. This has been in operation since 2002. Uh, what the dates you see there is the, is the most recent phase, phase five. And we are now in the process of negotiating phase six. Phase five, just for this period, <coughs> September 2008 to December 2010, the budget was $632 million. <coughs> 14 donors contributed. Basically, the most important thing it does are these two. Formation of the Afghan National Police, because the National Police Force was completely destroyed. And there was no police left uh, when the Taliban went out in 2002. Uh, they, most of the police had either disappeared or had integrated with the anti-government elements. So and the National Police Force was created from scratch. And today, the National Police Force is about 80,000 strong. And we are very confident uh, that 60 to 70 percent of them are active policemen in active duty. Um, at least to that extent, we can verify in terms of. So this program basically pays their salaries every month. So basically, if UNDP closes down tomorrow in Afghanistan, the bottom line, the national police will go without pay. And you can imagine if there is a one angry policeman, <laughs> what would be the effect of that? So it's, uh, it's one of the things. I'm just giving you this just to make you understand to what basic levels the programming has to go. So this is, uh, you, you will hardly find parallels like this in very many countries. Even in Iraq, uh, the destruction was not so complete. Uh, there's still local institutions were there which were able to take over. The other thing, of course, it does is to develop the whole police system and the Ministry of Interior, etc. Uh, let's not uh, spend much time. So this is basically, uh, I will, I'll be glad to leave this electronic presentation with Mary Lee and if any of you are interested, uh, you're most welcome to access it. All the information here is very much available on, on, on public domain. Um, Maybe we won't spend any time, but just to give you an idea, see which are all the donors. 
which are contributing to the law and order trust fund. US is the biggest donor at 31% of the budget, followed by European Union and Japan. Uh, US's contribution last year uh, for this program alone uh, was well in excess of, uh, I think, uh, well, basically 31% of about 600 million. So you can imagine, that was US's contribution. And Japan <coughs> is also very high contribution. Um, and uh, now, I just wanted to spend two minutes, two seconds on this slide uh, just to tell you what we have managed to do. Because often the question I get is that is UNDP there paying salaries to the police? Uh, it's not that simple. Uh, what we have basically done is one of the biggest challenges for us was the question of ghost policemen. Is the payment being made to an actual policeman or even worse is the money ending up in wrong hands? So two things we have done which is very, uh, which is very uh, interesting. One is we have helped the Ministry of Interior create an electronic payroll system which now covers 99% of all the policemen. Um, the only places where it doesn't cover could possibly be areas like Padakshan, very remote where even a computer is non-existent. And how we managed to do it is also very interesting. We provided to each and every one of the 34 provincial police headquarters in Afghanistan. We provided them computers, we provided them training to use it. Every computer provided has to be given uh, a VSAT connection because there is no connectivity otherwise and they will have to be provided with a generator because most of the time there is no power. So this is what we have managed to do. So we have an electronic payroll system uh, about which we are very happy. We have also gone one step further and are now doing electronic fund transfer. Almost 78% of the policemen no longer get their money through a middleman, through a government institution. It goes from Kabul, it goes directly into their individual bank accounts. Uh, here again, we are not able to expand it merely because of technological uh, limitations. Otherwise, we would very much like, what the donors want us to is to raise this to 100%. And that's going to be a huge uh, challenge in the, in, in the country. Um, ah, this is another interesting thing that I wanted to share with you. What we are now trying to do, starting this year, is to make the electronic payroll system, which now operates on a series of CDs going across the country, we are now trying to make it web-based. Uh, this is a very ambitious project. We are doing it in, uh, we are trying it out in three or four provinces, um, at least those that have good connectivity. Let us see how, how it works out. <coughs> Uh, we are also looking at uh, um, another method of transferring money through mobile telephones. The mobile telephone penetration in Afghanistan is amazing. Uh, you can practically, uh, my US phone practically works. I'm yet to go to a place in Afghanistan where my US phone hasn't worked. So it's, the mobile phone penetration is quite, uh, quite impressive. Um, we also do construction, refurbishment activities like police gym, you see, these are all the basic things. Uh, a police gym is unheard of. Uh, ten facilities for health and fire brigade, uh, drug rehabilitation center, police training centers in various areas. Uh, this is the one I briefly talked about. I'll finish with the next couple of slides. Uh, this is a new program. As you see, we just started it last year. Uh, but this is going to become one of the most important programs because this is the program that is going to basically create the political and judicial conditions for peace and reconciliation by encouraging the foot soldiers and commanders to give up weapons, give up arms, give up links to terrorist organizations and come back and work, uh, be, become a part of the community. And on the other hand, we are encouraging and providing support to local communities to receive them, to be able to integrate them. This is going to be a huge focus uh, for the whole of UN. Um, and we do it through social outreach, confidence building negotiation. Then we demobilize. And finally, we bring them in uh, into, the, into the main fold. Um, election support is something else that we have been doing. Uh, another major ticket item, so to say, for us. Uh, we have finally managed, uh, just to, out of, if you are curious, uh, this gentleman here, uh, this is actually a picture we took uh, just before the elections uh, where um, they were testing out the indelible ink. 
Uh, this gentleman here is the overall head of the United Nations in Afghanistan, uh, Stefan de Mistura. Uh, he's a Swedish Italian and he's the special representative of the Secretary General. He's the highest ranking official, UN official based in Afghanistan. And this is Mr. Manavi, who is the chair, chairman of the new chairman of the Independent Election Commission. Uh, and in fact, this ink story was very interesting because the ink was so indelible. This time, one of the ways by which the terrorists tried to threaten was to tell people that if anybody found roaming around with ink in their fingers, those fingers would be cut off. Uh, but despite that, we had over 42% polling. And out of that 42%, nearly 50% of votes were polled in women-only polling booths. So it's, it's truly impressive, the courage of the Afghan people. <coughs> anyway, we won't. Uh, uh, this is another very uh, important, interesting program. As you see, we are already in phase three. We have done two phases. Um, look, at, look at what this program has managed to achieve. Um, over 1,700 projects, uh, graveling in construction of uh, so many thousand kilometers of roads, 46 health and animal <coughs> clinics, it's, it's, a, it's a very impressive. This to me is the most important thing. Over 2.5 million labor days were created for rural population and an estimate of over 15 million persons benefited from these projects. Uh, this is one of our low key but uh, uh, really impacting development type of a project. I think I'll basically stop here. I have a lot more but if I run through all this uh, this is again another thing, subnational <coughs> governance. We are trying to <coughs> go subnational now, going out of Kabul and trying to create capacities in governmental institutions. Anti-corruption is a very big agenda. Um, uh, justice and human rights, and finally, national institution building program. So I will stop here. Uh, we have approximately 15 minutes, and we can. I'm quite happy to take uh, questions. I was interested if you have any slide on the budget distribution to these four regions that you have and the budget distribution. Ah, um, okay. I, I may not have a slide. I might have to search, but I can tell you. Um, if we go back, um, LOTFA, which is the biggest program, uh, uh, takes almost 50% of our budget. And uh, in an election no, year... I'm more interested in the geographical distribution ah, of the budget. Okay, geographical distribution, sorry. Uh, geographical distribution, no. I don't think we have, I, can, I do have the figures. But practically, as I told you, most of the South is cut off. Uh, mainly where it is more needed. Where it is more needed. That's the biggest challenge. Simply because the security situation is such that we are unable to operate. We have had so far several attacks on the UN. And the most ghastly one was uh, in 2009, uh, October, when a guest house was attacked. And we lost five of my colleagues died in that attack. Uh, last year in October was the complex attack in Herat. Uh, and repeatedly, our cars get bombed, our offices get destroyed. Uh, rockets landing even in the Kabul office is, is uh, if you travel as many times as I have done, you become impervious to uh, rockets falling and blowing up practically. So no, that is something. But mainly I can say this much. It will be concentrated on west, north, and northeast. The entire southern arc would be out of it. Um, I was wondering, I even if you, um, if, even if the, the UN and NATO manage to close the security gap, um, we basically have to teach Afghanis how to be self-sustainable and not to be dependent on foreign aid, which we can see is um, pretty bad at this point. How important do you think women empowerment and um, increasing of literacy rate are to all those processes? I don't think we can find any solution without that. Uh, it's one of the basic things. If 40% of your population is not even in a position to play an active role uh, in the day-to-day -day economic activity, uh, it, is, it is a huge, uh, huge challenge. It is not a lack of interest or a lack of uh, wanting to do that. Like we have some brilliant uh, female staff members in my team in Afghanistan uh, who are doing outstanding work. Um, and also please don't, uh, please don't mistake it for some of the practices that are prevalent in other countries 
which prevent explicitly women, for example, from driving or working. There is no such limitation in Afghanistan right now. But it is just that since the education system was so completely destroyed, it's going to take some time to build it up uh, and start uh, you know, focusing. Now, of course, the United Nations has formed last, uh, the beginning of this year a new women entity called the UN Women. Uh, who, are, who already have a large program in Afghanistan. So we hope that some of these issues can be addressed by them. In fact, as I was telling Marley, one of the appointments I'm missing uh, today, in fact, right today, is that the only woman minister in the Afghan cabinet is actually visiting New York today. Uh, she's an amazing lady once again. I've met her a couple of times. Uh, she's coming to, to UNDP today to meet with my administrator and associate administrator. So it's not as though women are not interested. It's just the circumstances have, have led to this. Yes, please. Uh, one assumes that ultimately there will have to be some kind of reintegration of all the parts. And that's where I find your suggestion most intriguing. Since many of the groups that are now resisting UN activities are opposed to the presence of foreign troops, and as sort of said, they aren't willing to dialogue until there's some indication the foreign troops are leaving, where does that put reintegration in terms of committing to stay, committing to leave, withdrawing slowly, what kind of strategy? Okay, I can, uh, I can use this opening you provided to show, show you one more slide, which is something very unique we are doing for the first time in Afghanistan. It's a program called Closing the Security Gap. Uh, his question is very pertinent, especially in the context of the international troops withdrawing. And if and when this withdrawal is completed in 2014, uh, it could well uh, leave us with a situation where we can't operate in most parts of Afghanistan. Because traditionally for the UN, or for that matter even uh, US civilians working in Afghanistan, the security is not provided by flying in Marines all the time. It's basically the local security forces that provide that security, mainly for UN. First of all, as many of you may know, UN does not have an army or a or even a police of our own. Uh, we only have uh, what we call as CPOs, close protection officers. Uh, these are basically huge burly guys, ex-rangers, uh, ex-marines. Uh, I have two of them following me wherever I go in Afghanistan. And between them, I think they don't even need a car. They can just literally lift me and <laughs> take me along like a, like a piece of baggage. Uh, so the, the thing we are trying to do here is for the first ever time, we have negotiated with the government of Afghanistan and we are trying to create a separate cadre which are drawn from Afghan police and Afghan army but will be better trained, better equipped, better paid <coughs> and they will start providing static and mobile security to the UN personnel. It will begin with UN first and then we are hoping to expand it to uh, other entities also. This is a very unique thing. We, UN has never done this in any other country before, except <coughs> when UN itself was the government in a particular country, which, hap which has happened several times. Like it happened most recently when, uh, when East Timor, Timor Leste, became a free country in, in 2002. They voted in a referendum to break away from Indonesia. And for nearly one year and few months, UN was running the transitional uh, administrative authority. So we were the government. Except in those cases, we have never done this before. We are trying. It has just started. Uh, so this could be a solution to the issue you raised. But your issue is very well taken. Without a solution to that, um, the whole reintegration can simply uh, uh, come to nothing. Sorry. Two. <coughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say, besides the poppy production, is there a potential for any sustainable agriculture in Afghanistan? A local food source on a large scale? It's a very difficult challenge, simply because, not because of anything else. Yes, in terms of capacity to grow, opportunity to grow, yes, there is plenty. But the problem is, the prices the farmer gets for uh, an acre or hectare of poppy is just uncomparable. We even tried, UNDP ran a program till a few years ago called the Counter-Narcotics Trust Fund, CNTF, where 
we were going into the market and buying away opium, paying prices higher than what the market will pay in a way to take it off circulation. Even that didn't work. So till we break this nexus, it is going to be very difficult. Because after all, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, are you going to be able to tell a local Afghan farmer, um, you know, sorry, uh, you cannot earn a better income simply because what you're growing is not uh, what we want you to grow. So it's a, it's a very difficult ask. Attempts are on, uh, but then it also leads you to a lot of challenges. Like for example, even if you grow, uh, there are lots of dry fruits. Afghanistan is very famous for dry fruits. The problem is that there is no chain. There's no chain for storage. There is no chain for transportation. There's no chain for uh, export to other countries. So agriculture, weaning away farmers from poppy crop is not just something that you can go and do. It has to have a lot of attendary things, which is what is being worked on right now. But it is, it is a huge uh, challenge. Um, uh, well, given that, uh, I guess I have a follow-up question. Uh, the, so given the inability to uh, incentivize alternative crop production, do you, or do you, would you support uh, uh, abilities to eliminate um, uh, opium production, either from ground forces or from planes above in the air? And if so, which one do you think is better, ground elimination or air elimination? Okay, this is something that I must clarify right at the beginning. This is something that the UN by itself will not do. Okay. Because as I said, we don't have a military, we don't have an air force of our own. Uh, but efforts are definitely on. One of the big tasks that the NATO troops are performing in Afghanistan is to basically try and destroy as much as production as possible. But the thing is, you destroy it today, and six months later, there's another crop. So you know, it's a it's a it's a sort of a cat and mouse game. You never uh, will end it. So that's the uh, that's the challenge. Yeah, I just was curious about. I mean. The only reason they're growing poppies is because we are buying them, we got buying the opium. So why doesn't the UN do something about the consumers? <laughs> if you cut off the consumers, then there's no poppy growing. I mean, and the, this is, seems such a waste of effort and waste of money. Um, the UN is pouring so much money, the US is pouring so much money, and all of it is going into bank accounts in Abu Dhabi and, and, and Dubai. Places. So, yeah. I mean, if you're setting up the internet system, there should be a way to monitor how much money is taking out of the country. Um, if, there's, if you're setting up internet systems to allow communication, um, you can also stop transport of things out of the country. I mean, why, why aren't people, who's, who's benefiting from all the sale of the opium? It's not the poor farmer. No, and absolutely it's not. not. The Taliban. Absolutely it's not the Taliban. Uh, to no, some extent, it's, yes. It's all the people in Russia and Europe and America sure. who are selling it on the streets and getting the money for it. Exactly. So we need to figure out where the problem is. And it's not there, it's here. It's here. You're absolutely <coughs> right. Why does the UN do something about here? Well, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> well, maybe we should start a campaign right here uh, well, in the US right here, to stop I mean, uh, wean away youngsters from the using... the governments of these countries, countries who are giving Europe. the UN money Europe. Yeah. Yeah. to stop something that they themselves <coughs> are supporting. So it's just really crazy. Anyway, sorry. sorry. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very valid point. We do have a UN entity exclusively for fighting drugs, the Office of Drug Control, UNODC. But, uh, but you know, especially in a situation like Afghanistan, you need to have very aggressive methods, which is not something that the UN can do all the time. So that's, any other questions? Sure, right at the back. I'll come back to you. You mentioned uh, a lack of in-country resources, and I just wondered, um, even given all the problems that you've outlined, and, uh, uh, obstacles to development, do you have <coughs> any hints of potential markets that could take root in Afghanistan? Like you mentioned dry foods uh, or any entrepreneurial opportunities that you see as trends that could develop over the next 20 years? Sure. Uh, in fact, we ourselves, UNDP itself has been working on promoting entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the things that we found that which has very good potential was uh, cooking oils. Uh, to cultivate the various ingredients to extract co cooking oil and what we did. Uh, Malaysia has one of the best uh, systems where they, uh, where they make this cooking oil called pamulin. So basically we enabled a team of Malaysian entrepreneurs to come and help people set it up in Afghanistan. So this is just one example I'm giving you. But there are efforts uh, in that direction. 
to, to try and see whether there could be... Uh, uh, what I meant by a severe lack of capacity is also not so much the resources, but it is also the human capital, uh, which, is, which is very, very low. That's, that's been one of our biggest challenges. But efforts are on... See, the difficulty I would like you to appreciate Normally, this is typically a type of an issue that would be in the forefront of UN's program anywhere in the world. But the problem is that the context in which we are working in Afghanistan is such uh, that I don't even have. If you look at my list of nine programs, there is nothing on uh, entrepreneurship promotion or creation of market chain. Because the other priorities simply beat us uh, to these rather than do that. So that's an added... Uh, Added uh, problem in Afghanistan. And briefly, there was a mention of, of millions, if not billions, of dollars of rare metals in Afghanistan. Where did that come from? Is it real? And I, I can. Good question. Yes, it is not millions, it's in billions. Uh, it is based on a very credible survey done by the US Geological Survey and the British Geological Survey. Uh, there are supposed to be some very rare metals. Um, and right now, in fact, UNDP, at the request of the government, is working with the Ministry of Mines uh, to see how one can start exploiting this potential. Uh, but the difficulty, again, is that so far, uh, as just to sort of, uh, on a trial basis, uh, our guys floated out a tender uh, to see. And so far, no international companies, other than a few odd Chinese companies, are willing to come in. So you know, if you're going to have face a situation where yeah, people are going to get blown up, uh, it's it's tough. Chinese have been the only ones who have been <coughs> courageous enough to build. But let's see where it goes. It's just started. But it is a credible report. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your talk.